Welcome to Reproductive Justice Now, sponsored by the Philadelphia chapter of the National Organization for Women. Across the nation and here in Pennsylvania, states are limiting a woman's right to an abortion. These attacks on abortion also undermine access to contraception. Chipping away at abortion erodes the same legal rights to the pill, patches, the IUD, and even condoms. I'm Karen Hunt, and I spoke with historian Heather Monroe Prescott, author of The Morning After, The History of Emergency Contraception in the United States. We talk about the historic struggle to control women's fertility and current efforts to roll back women's rights. Hi, I'm Karen Hunt. I'm here today with uh, Carol Downer. She is a founder of the Feminist Women's Health Center in California and a, a pioneer of the women's health movement. Uh, she's also a leading feminist in the country. Thank you for joining Thanks. us. Uh, the, the Feminist Women's Health Center was, has been described by many people as the epicenter of the women's health movement. Um, can you describe a little bit uh, the mood of the 70s before Roe v. Wade and uh, how the Feminist Women's Health Center came about? Well, in the late 60s, there was quite a ferment in this country about civil rights and the war. There was an overall, um, you know, reconsideration and challenging. And part of that was uh, people were demanding that the antiquated and are just brutal laws of abortion be changed. At that time, abortion was illegal in this country, except in a very few states. And we had many deaths uh, from abortion, and also women were uh, forced to travel to other countries. And at that point, um, you know, women started waking up. They started uh, having demonstrations. This is when I became involved. I'm speaking now of the late, very, very late 60s and very early 70s. Uh, now, women in general who were out there on their front lines working for civil rights and um, opposing the war, realized that, um, you know, what do you know? They were second-class citizens themselves. And in that context, they began to demand control over their reproduction. You know, it's one thing to be a, a feminist activist, a NOW member, as you were mm -hmm. uh, in the early 70s, but to to turn your experience around and 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 you know found a uh, a women's health center and to um, put together you know self exams can can you describe that that sort of epiphany and uh, and 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 how you started the the center? I think it's when I first saw another woman's cervix. <laughs> I think that was the most significant time. Uh, I had been on the abortion committee and I had been working with other women to support a local uh, abortionist who had been arrested and as a consequence I had observed his uh, procedures and seen a young woman's cervix. This was my friend's daughter who was getting an IUD and I, I just kind of tagged along with her into the procedure room and wow here was this cervix right in front of me. And it, it just was so beautiful and so simple and so accessible that, you know, here I had had six kids and I'd never seen my cervix. And I thought abortion was just this uh, life risking, you know, procedure that, you know, was horrible. And I suddenly realized that uh, if it was, it was only because it had been denied to women and was being done by illegal practitioners who didn't know what they were doing. And at that particular moment, the, you know, the veil was lifted and, you know, I, I, I could see the clear path was for us to share that knowledge, learn how to do this, and take it back. So you designed these, um, can you describe a self exam uh, meeting like I mean how because it's kind of a crazy I mean it's a crazy idea to it's not that crazy honestly like you know looking back at it now it, it totally makes sense to encourage women to have the self-knowledge uh, of their of their bodies um, but I, I guess maybe uh, women don't well, it's a matter of consciousness of, of not really understanding the um, 
you know, how we're separated from knowledge of our, of our bodies and by the medical profession and, and such. But, but can you describe, uh, you know, what, what, what the um, mission sort of was of the uh, Feminist Women's Health Center? Feminist Women's Health Center. Well, our first mission was very, very serious. We were going to learn how to do abortions. We knew that the authorities were going to come after us. We were all going to get arrested, and then the laws would change. I mean, we just really were seeing this kind of movement in the society, and we had that kind of faith that we would be able to do that. Well, in order to do that, we had to learn about our own bodies, and we had to work with each other and demystify. So we gathered women together and to talk to them about it. And, and they were equally serious and worried and thinking this was a terribly dangerous thing to do, even if quite necessary. And at that point, I felt that it would be helpful to them if I were to show them my cervix. And lo <laughs> and behold, I mean, not, not only did they all have the same aha as I did, but from being this deadly political, you know, serious project, we all became extremely happy, and <laughs> had fun. We realized, uh, you know, that we could leave that uh, fear and shame and ignorance behind us, and that we were doing something eminently practical, yeah. eminently empowering. wholesome, and powerful, and powerful. And, uh, and powerful. And we felt powerful, and, and we were powerful. You know, we were taking control. Roe so Roe v. Passed. Wade passed, mm -hmm. um, so Roe v. and uh, passed. the Feminist and Women's and Health uh, Center got up to speed in how, how fast did you get up to speed to become an abortion provider? Within 50 days, <laughs> we went out and got scurried and, and scraped up the funding, um, put everything on the credit card, or actually in that time a credit, you know, list, and we, we were receiving women, and they came in. We had uh, a beautiful little clinic, and certainly modest by today's standard, but believe me, it was scrubbed to the end. It shone. It had curtains. It had so it's uh, so very women centered. Very much so. Can you can you describe to me um, what uh, in those states the five states that that did have access to abortion? What how easy was it to to get an abortion? So you had the legal right, but was that all that was necessary? Um, well, the only state where it was not only legal but uh, accessible, at least once you got there, was New York. Uh, California, it was legal but not accessible. Um, doctors and, cl and hospitals just didn't want to touch it. So we had had legal abortion for several years, four years, and it was making no difference. Uh, that's really, you know, what we learned is that um, it's important to, and it's essential and, and mandatory and otherwise unacceptable, um, you know, to have any laws relating to abortion, really, they're, they're, they, sh they, sh they shouldn't exist. But if we do have them, of course, we have to have ones that are, you know, really permit women to just have regulated. That's, that's really the only excuse for it would be to make sure that they have trained personnel and are had medically, you know, sufficient. But that doesn't have, have women, women should have, have no, no more uh, regulation than a man who wants to have a vasectomy. I mean, I mean what, 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 if the man, man wants, wants a vasectomy, vasectomy makes, makes an appointment, appointment the, doctor the doctor goes in, has it, uh, uh, there's, there's no state, state record, record of vasectomies. vasectomies. Every, every state, state keeps very careful tallies on, on abortions. abortions. Every, every abortion provider, provider is very rigorously, very rigorously regulated in this country. Um, it's, it's treated, treated as, as a, a uh, politically sensitive, sensitive um, procedure. procedure. Um, as, as we know, know many, many of them have, have uh, big, big lines, lines of picketers, picketers and shouting people, people that you have to walk through to get, get to them. them. 
No, no it's, uh, it's, it's totally, totally unacceptable. unacceptable. Of, of the United States um, policy in terms of family planning throughout the country uh, is separate from abortion and it's also separate from the midwife model of care. Can you just talk a little bit about, about that? Well, you know, we ever since the end of the 19th century, um, philanthropy has played a very big role in the United States in the field of, of health and standards. So they're a big player. I mean, whether it's the Rockefeller Foundation initially or now currently the Gates Foundation. So they have a lot of influence on these things. And unfortunately, uh, it is a conservatizing influence because um, they don't want to upset people. And they, they really are not, they're, their focus is not women's rights per se. They are looking from the standpoint of uh, paternalistic, you know, how do we help people? And that, that may or may not be helpful. Helping as opposed to helping women help themselves. Exactly. I mean, for example, um, Bill and Melinda Gates are donating $1.5 billion to improve maternal and infant health in third world countries. But they have very specifically said that they will not spend one cent of it on abortion. And did they say why? Was there, are they, is it a religious decision or? I mean, I'm just curious, did, did they ever say? It was strictly a uh, expedient decision. I think they political, were. Political, political. Yeah, speech. it was pretty clear. I don't think they spelled it out, but it, you could see that it had to do with wanting to appease the sections. Not be, not be controversial. Not be controversial. And um, they are willing to support birth control, which is good. Of course, abortion is a form of birth control, but they excluded it. When it comes to the whole matter of midwifery, here again, it's, um, they're looking at it not as women's rights, or for that matter, babies' rights, <laughs> to you know, come into this world in the most healthy um, and humane atmosphere and to the warmth of their families. Uh, instead, they're looking at statistics of, you know, what, and they're explaining those statistics, in my opinion, completely erroneously. I mean, yes, there is a, a serious problem with the, you know, infant and maternal mor mortality in third world countries, uh, but it's more economic and cultural, and by that I mean Women who are, you know, 13, 14 years old are giving birth to babies and they are not yet physically mature and they're experiencing these uh, problems, um, you know, they're uh, damage to their uteruses and uh, harm to their infants. So instead, they're approaching it, they're blaming the midwives, basically. Um, saying, well, not only blaming them, but saying they don't have enough of them. Now, I know that sounds a bit contradictory. It does. <laughs> and I think they do plan to create and, and sponsor and support more midwives in the third world setting. But my concern is that they're going to do it here again in this very paternalistic way, mostly through regulation uh, and supervision and in what we call here risking out uh, women with problems mm -hmm. and funneling them into um, hosp you know, central hospitals and so forth. Sure, well that's a, that, I mean, every midwife um, that I've talked to that every, whenever I've talked to someone who runs a, a birth center, um, <coughs> they're, the bedrock of their philosophy is, you know, the, the risk I mean, they, they do just deal with the normal, mm -hmm. normal pregnancy. Um, and they do, uh, whenever there's any, even just the littlest problem, they will refer um, that patient to a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, so, that, so that they really are just getting 
you know, normal um, births that don't require a, a lot of intervention. But my understanding is that there are a lot, there should be a lot more normal births than there are right now in, in our country, not even, I mean, not even talking about, you know, other you know, countries. I have just fi finished reading a wonderful book by Mary Breckenridge about the Frontier Nursing Service in Kentucky. She started this in 1925, and she's reporting on their statistics, which they kept very carefully. And these were nurse midwives who rode on their by horseback out to the cabins, wow. did home births. Um, you know, and this is over, at the time she wrote her book, it was 25 years at that point. They had 5% cesarean rate. They had a, a much lower than average uh, infant and mortality rate than the general population. Um, and, the, and these were home births. And, you know, this, uh, these women, you know, were trained as nurses so they could deal with some health problems, but they've also brought in uh, physicians who, who also rode the horses to get in. Why do we have so much trouble? Can you describe the midwife model of care briefly and, 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 and why do we have so much trouble advocating for the midwife model of care in this country? Well, the training of a midwife is to uh, be a, 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 a trained, learned, supportive companion to a woman in the process of that woman herself giving birth. Now where the training comes in with the midwife besides learning, you know, having attended births, having been trained in that way, she knows what's normal and you know whether it's just the way a woman moves her body when she has a contraction or whatever. I mean she is spotting all of this. She's aware and so that she can, you know, help her adjust or exactly. Oh, well, and which, you know, ninety-five percent of the time is is fine. Um, but when it isn't, she's going to spot that. But she's going to make sure that it is fine in the way of assisting that woman to get food and water and comfort and support from her family, um, everything that will facilitate her body doing the job that it needs to do, which is to basically go through the birth process and make a baby. Unfortunately, Does when it. you go into the hospital, we're now in a whole different mode where the doctor is thinking, you know, malpractice. He's thinking any problem that crops up, every test in the world has to be performed. Um, and, and always the most conservative uh, possibility is looked at, the most scary. Um, also, time. Uh, you can take a long time to give birth at home, but when you're in the hospital, time is money. And, you know, they don't want to take a long time. So pretty soon, um, intervention starts happening, little things to help. Little thing. You, uh, you, like you said earlier, when you were speaking earlier, you're talking about the failure to progress. Mm -hmm. And failure to progress is something, I mean, I know I heard it, well, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and I think a lot of women hear it, you know, mm -hmm. it's like you're not uh, yeah. dilated enough at, you know, and, and, and again, here you have this whole language of somehow the woman's not doing it right. Right? Mm -hmm. like, exactly. like, I'm sorry, you're not dilated enough. It's been however many hours, and you're not dilated. You're failing to progress. You're failing at childbirth. You're failing right. at pregnancy. That's well, pretty. and you know, now when we started, this knowledge at that time did not exist. But today, the understanding of the hormones that are produced in the process of the normal birth uh, help us to see how. Uh, you know, some hormones are cause the muscles to contract and cause the body to get alert and so mobilize. Mm -hmm. Right. Others give pleasure and relax and, you know, and we find that physical position, touch, 
comfort, that these all very much influence these hormones. And when they're working in the designated ways that they're supposed to. Sort of harmoniously. <laughs> yes, hormonally and harmoniously. <laughs> they, things do progress. And women do give, their, you know, give birth with a minimal amount of, you know, unbearable pain. I don't want to rule out, you know, normal pain of effort that does get involved. But that is manageable, and midwives know how to help women to um, go through that, you know, very handily. And and then the other thing is is that uh, the mid, mid a midwife model of care would significantly lower costs. I mean, what hospitals are always complaining about is how expensive childbirth is, mm -hmm. um, and a midwife model of care would significantly lower costs because this at the center of the model is. This idea that really it's the wom woman, women are, who are doing all the work. It's not the baby or the, the doctors who are delivering the babies. It's it's the <laughs> women who are actually birthing the babies. You know. Well, you know when at the time that we did our watch inspection in 1979 in Tallahassee, Florida, of a maternal uh, maternity center or uh, the hospital maternal ward, uh, they had a 15 percent. Uh, C-section rate, which we thought and is outrageous, <laughs> but today it is between 30, it could be even 40, 40, you know, more than 40 percent. Now, pretty, this, this is major surgery. It completely separates the mother and the baby. It, you know, it um, interrupts the bonding. It interrupts the ability to. Uh, nurse the baby. I mean, it, it, it is so violently disruptive. Uh, we, we are obviously in a crisis situation. We are not in a <laughs> position to go around exporting this model. And I do believe that this is what has a very great danger of happening in the third world countries under the auspices of these so-called, you know, well-intentioned, benevolent people. Well, what can we do to try and stem that tide, if anything? Oh, we can do so much. And it's, fortunately, it's very much within our ability to do. <laughs> uh, we can start talking to each other. We can uh, support each other. We can learn about our bodies, both through using the speculum, sharing experiences, reading. We can question our doctors. We can learn you know, what to expect. We can demand what to expect. We can support other women in their demands. I'm telling you, when the people of Egypt decided they didn't want to have Mubarak anymore, they didn't. It takes that level of women uh, realizing that uh, we and our babies need this and that we have a right to have freedom in our sexuality, in our um, control of our reproduction, to have our babies, or in, if we are in a situation we don't want to be pregnant, where we can get a safe abortion. When we demand that as a fundamental right, individually and collectively, it will happen. Let me um, go back and ask you about what is that? All right. Um, so I noticed. Uh, what 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 are you holding in your hand there? This is a vaginal speculum, and most of us know it this way. The doctor uses it like so, puts it into the vagina, squeezes the handles, mm -hmm. opens it, and then looks in. Right. That, and here's our cervix back here, all three inches back. Uh, when we put it to our use, we turn it this way put it in, and using a mirror here, and shining a light and bouncing it off, then we see our own cervix. We can do this alone. First time I did it, I did it in my home. It took me about a half an hour to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I finally managed. And when we do it uh, in groups, however, it's much more valuable because, you know, you can, 
you know, we know what a nose looks like, right? We know that. We've seen thousands of them. Well, same with the cervix. If you only see one cervix, you don't know if that's right or wrong. But as soon as you see the cervixes of a few other women, then you begin to get an idea of what a cervix looks like. So, and you hear their experiences, and you know, we share things in a way that, frankly, uh, the medical profession doesn't have a clue about, because they, know, they not only don't ask the question, furthermore, they don't even think it's important. <laughs> I mean, it's not medical. What, which question is that, though? Well, for example, they're not interested in our menstrual cramps and what makes us feel better. Uh, they're not, that, you know, they just give us a, if we have a problem, they give us a drug. I mean, that's as far as their interest goes. Um, you know, they're, they're trained for disease and for, um, you know, helping people who are injured, whatever. But just normal functioning. Sort of in sickness, uh, they're trained in sickness as opposed to wellness. Exactly. Well, and, and also just uh, ordinary, like, women will find it very interesting to know what if uh, some of our moods are related to our cycles or not. Very definitely. That matters to us, but it's just not in their purview. So that's the kind of knowledge that we can gain and we can, you know, understand. I mean, let's obviously in the near future, we're not going to stop going uh, to doctors. Um, for some things, and when we do, this helps us to understand what they're telling us and do what their, you know, their instructions. Otherwise, it's all just uh, rote. I think um, it's also that kind of self-knowledge for women is very useful in the face of these uh, crisis pregnancy centers, which, mm. and, but those crisis, crisis pregnancy, pregnancy centers, centers are also, also spawn, spawn, I mean, they're, they're some of the same these organizations. Fakes, fakes you're talking about. Yes. yes. Let's yes. get right down to yes, it. Yes, they're, they're, they aren't offering um, facts, you know, based on science. You know, they're not offering um, health care based on scientific fact. They're scaring women into believing that uh, getting an abortion or even going on birth control is going to have some kind of long term, you know, health effects on them. Of course, you know, there are. I mean, mm -hmm. every, every woman is different, different and, but this, this, this isn't, isn't about facts. facts. This is about, about scaring, scaring women away from exactly. knowledge, knowledge of themselves and knowledge of their, of their, of their body, body, I think. And also, and also I mean, shame. shame. I think shame, shame has a huge, huge plays a, a, a huge factor, factor in, in um, the, whole the whole abortion, abortion debate. I mean, I women mean, won't talk about abortion because it's such a personal and private event. I mean, I mean, honestly, honestly women, women don't really talk, talk about, about their, their, their pregnancies either. either. I, mean, I mean, it's, it's only, only really, really very recently, recently and I'm, I, remember I remember growing, growing up, up, my grandfather, grandfather would leave the room if women were talking about their pregnancy. pregnancy. <laughs> 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 it's like, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean um, but, but, but I think women are... Well, try talking about your periods. Right. I mean, you don't have to talk about your grandfather. You can talk about your, you know, boyfriend or your... Uh, neighbor, your son. I mean, they don't want to hear that. That's sure. that's yeah. nasty <laughs> stuff. And, and they convey that, you know. And it's um, it, unfortunately they happen to. That philosophy controls the world. We are <clears throat> women are not in control in this society, and this is one of the ways that it shows. You actually, uh, maybe you could just restate this in your own words, but when we were eating lunch, you were talking about uh, the physical means. I was talking about, you know, trying to get more rights for women and trying to see reproductive rights as a, as a package of rights, uh, sort of a continuum of rights that are a, a political, um, something that we need to achieve politically. But you very rightly pointed out that, you know, you can have, you can have rights, but if you don't have actual access and, and knowledge, knowledge and control. And control. Well, well, you know, I think in raising our kids or anything in, in life, it, one principle is that you first take care of things 
on your own if you can. Now, if you can't, then of course you've got to go to someone else. <clears throat> but it so happens that we have within our own means the ability to learn about our bodies, to deal with ordinary infections, to uh, help our menstrual periods, to uh, learn about menstruation, use many natural effective methods of birth control, and with the supportive health of a midwife, give birth ourselves. So why, why would we want to first go to the authority? Why wouldn't we want to explore all of those things? Or why would we need to have it written down in some uh, law book? I mean, this is... Uh, common sense. It's, it's, it's just, just common, common sense. sense. And, and I, I do, do think, think that, that um, sometimes, sometimes you know, you know, we focus, we focus on, on working, working in, in a, 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 what, what, a, a legislative, legislative or political, political arena, arena when, when first, first we should work, work in the practical, practical on hands-on, hands on, you know, you know let's, let's, uh, let's, let's solve, solve this problem, problem on, on our own. own. And, and it is, and it and is, it is very, very physical. physical. I, I think this is what, what we were talking, talking about before, before is, is that, that um, some, some problems, problems are mental, mental <laughs> psychological. Some, Some problems, problems are physical. If you, if you want, want to uh, you know, protect, protect your, your health, health it's, it's, you, have you have to make sure, sure you have warm clothes, clothes on. I mean, that is a physical reality. And, and same, same goes with uh, taking, taking care, care of our reproductive, reproductive health. health. This, this is the way, way in which women have, have been kept down over the centuries. centuries by, by Unwanted, unwanted pregnancies, pregnancies not, being not being able to resist, resist having sex with their husbands, husbands uh, not, not being, being able to, you know, you know control, control all, all of those facts, facts. and, and that's, that's, that's our, our oppression. oppression. And, and that, that is, is the root we have to, to well, you know, you know, get, get unoppressed, we have, we have to first get control of our bodies. bodies. If we, if we want, want to have sex every day on the hour with Whomever, whomever we wish, wish that, that is our absolute, absolute right, and, and we need to understand, understand that. that. And, that and that is, you know, we have, have to have, have social, social responsibility, responsibility but, but that, that is, is quite different than moral, moral responsibility. responsibility. You, know, you know, that, that somehow, somehow we, we should not, not be, have, have that, 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 that moral procreative and recreational, all, all, all that, of that whole array, array of things. things. That, that, it's for, for us, us to do, and, and we can, can. We, we can, except for uh, we are currently experiencing at, at the national level and at the, at, you know, the state level an onslaught of um, bills that uh, will regulate women's access to reproductive health care, not, not just um, abortion access, but also access to family planning. and when during the Bush administration there was a problem with with people getting just basic sex education in high school right well I do believe that in a way they've done us a favor with this um, new program of, of you know war against abortion war against birth control because they put it right out there on the table it's no no secret now they, they used to say it was just abortion that was bad. But now, you know what? It's always been the trait case, but now they're admitting that they don't want us to have any control at all. And I think that once, once women hear this, I think they're just really um, gonna see the, these right-wing men for what they are, which is, you know, just oppressive, controlling, uh, guys that want to keep us in line, keep everything all nice and hunky dory like they like. But, but I think that the genie is out of the bottle. <laughs> Not every woman is at the point of wanting to do cervical examination, but I think most women take it for granted in this country today that if they want to take the pill, they, that's their right. If they want to um, have an abortion, that is their right. And I think that they are not going to let this come to pass. 
So I, I watch with great um, eagerness to see, you know, what American women are going to do if these guys are successful. I mean, I mean right, right now, now of, course. of course, we try to fight them legislatively. But if we don't and they get these draconian laws, uh, there's going to be a revolution like they can't even imagine. I mean, they have no idea of <laughs> how completely angry women are going to be. And that's, and that's across, across the political, political spectrum. spectrum. I've heard, I've heard about, about the, the great, great yogurt, yogurt conspiracy. conspiracy. <laughs> Can you describe, describe that, that, please? What, 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 was, what the, was the, the great, great yogurt conspiracy? conspiracy? The, the great yogurt conspiracy was the term that women used to describe the fact that the uh, Board of Medical Quality Exam, I mean, excuse me, Board of Medical Examiners in California in 1972 came in and arrested me and another woman based on the fact that I had helped another woman who put in her own speculum and I helped her to apply yogurt to help her treat a yeast condition. <laughs> <laughs> this was a crime. Yes. This was a crime, and I went to trial for this. What crime was it? What did they charge you? Practicing medicine without a license. That so, uh, so I've heard of the Great Yogurt Conspiracy. Can you? What, what is the Great Yogurt Conspiracy? Well, the Great Yogurt Conspiracy was the name that women across the country gave to my arrest and trial on charges that I had inserted yogurt into a woman's vagina for the treatment of a yeast condition. And I actually was charged with practicing medicine without a license, which carried six months in jail and a thousand dollar fine. How could they, how did they call that? I mean, that just seems so ridiculous. Well, in today it does, but in, unfortunately in 1970, a woman's uh, genitals and vagina and her uterus were all considered medical. I mean, or sexual, I guess, in her, you know, her, her lover. But in any other context, it was medical. And that if you tried to do something, why, you had to be a doctor. Because after all, what if you had cancer? What if, what if it was, you know, some some other illness. I mean, this has been argued very seriously by, by doctors as to how dangerous that was for me to assist that woman to put in, in yogurt. And they can argue that with a straight face? Oh, Ser yes. Seriously. That's yes. So you seem to know a lot about uh, Romania. Can you, can you describe just sort of in your own words um, their experience with abortion bans? In Romania, this was in the late 60s, right at the time when we started. Uh, they had a uh, takeover by Ceausescu, and where before they had a very low birth rate. I think it was like 13 per thousand women, you know, births a year, just, just on, on par, par with, with the lowest. lowest. Nine, Nine months. months after he took over, the birth rate jumped to. 44 per thousand, equivalent to sub-Saharan Africa. And the way that they accomplished this was to abolish abortion, abolish birth control, and to make every woman come in for a monthly check to make sure she had her period. They, they totally, totally enforced force this. this. And, and women, women were forced, forced to bear, bear Many, many, many babies, babies that, that they, they could, could not support, support you, know. you know. But that's, that's fine. fine. The state said that, that that's okay. They, they took them and warehoused them in uh, orphanages. orphanages. And, and unfortunately, there were thousands upon thousands of poor little Romanian, Romanian children that they liberated after he was overthrown that, that you, know, you know, were completely um, Without, without any, any ability, ability to, to take care, care of themselves, themselves language, language skills, skills, anything, anything. they were uh, dehumanized because they, they didn't bother to even take care of them, touch them, just kept them alive in these little cribs. cribs. So, so 
that, that is, is the ultimate, ultimate expression of woman, woman control, control at what, what we call the pronatalist. Now, now we, we see in China, China where they, they want to control the population, population. So, so women have to get abortions. abortions. The state, state doesn't, doesn't want, want them to have more than one, at the, the most two children. children. Well, well, whatever the justification on that, but the point is that the woman, woman has no control. control. In, in this case, case neither does the husband. husband. That's, That's antinatalist. So, so even, even though from in our heart of hearts, hearts it's, a, it's a rights issue, issue. You, know, you know, I mean, we, we just get outraged when someone, someone tells us that we can't control our bodies. bodies. What, what, if, if we're going to win this battle, we have to realize that we're fighting a very sophisticated political battle against, against people, people who hide those motives. I mean, I mean they, they always come out and talk about religion and all those things, but the, the, the truth of the matter is that their motivation is to work toward the kind of society they want, whether it's a humane democratic society or a uh, repressive regime. I mean, we're a political battleground. Our bodies are. We are. Well, I mean, we, we are. I mean, in every in every sense, in every battle you can think of, you know, whether it's it's in terms of how many babies we can have, or if we can choose to to not have babies at all, or in serial rape. I mean, in, as a as a as a uh, part of war, part and parcel of war. To you know, when you, when your side lose, loses, loses, the women get raped. You know. <laughs> How, how in the world, in, in such a, a physical, violent world, are women going to take control of their bodies and their futures? Any idea? Well, they're going to do it together. It's not a, it, this is not a problem that a woman can solve as an individual. I mean, yes, you can put in a speculum and that's nice. That will not change women's situation. It's when we look at this and say, let's work together and share with each other, support each other. Today, that I see, I see so many groups focused on whatever the threat is to abortion, and um, I, I also see women who are really very focused on childbirth and maternity care. Uh, how did they get so split in the first place? Because we were very, made up of mostly very, very young women, in the 70s. Uh, abortion and birth control were uppermost in their mind. And at that time, most babies were born in hospitals. Really, really there, there's, there's hardly any midwives whatsoever in this country. country. I mean, it was just very few babies were born at home or Mid with, with a, a midwife. midwife. Wow. And it took, you know, very strong, courageous people. And in this case, many times not coming from a feminist or rights perspective, but coming more from a consumer perspective. And, you know, the father's right to be in the delivery room and uh, lack of anesthesia, natural childbirth. And that developed, thank goodness, <laughs> you know, but independently from this feminist movement. With the pro the motherhood people, I think, I think they, they have made a very serious strategic, strategic error by not taking a strong support of abortion. And why? Because they don't want to alienate the people within their own ranks who are pronatalist, that is, you know, on the side of, let's go back to the old days, those good old days when, you know, Women stayed at home and just had lots of babies, and that was the natural way of life. People on the other side realized that the right to have a baby and to have it in the way that you want is just as important as the right to have an abortion. You're going to have that, that split, and it weakens us badly. And I, I frankly think it's a major reason that we're not making as much progress as we are. I agree. I definitely agree. Great to be here. Thank you.